Hello, everyone, and welcome to our November 360 lecture featuring artist Richard Wentworth. I'm Curator of Education, Anna Smith. To introduce Richard Wentworth today, we've invited another British Richard, artist Richard Patterson. Patterson studied at Goldsmiths College in the 1980s before gaining attention as part of the YBA group. He has since made his home in Dallas and has recently shown at the Goss Michael Foundation and may or may not have shown under an assumed name in the recent Art Foundation's exhibition, Twain. Please welcome Richard Patterson. Uh, well, I, I um, wanted to make a, a kind of an informal anecdotal introduction to Richard Wentworth and um, welcome him and Jane Wentworth to Dallas, not for the first time. Um, about four years ago, I think, uh, I was standing in my wife's gallery, which was called Road Agent, my wife's Christina Reese, in Dallas, and um, in walked a Scotsman called Gavin, who I'd never met before. And it turned out he was the, um, the new uh, curator at TCU's gallery. And um, we talked a bit, and, um, and I said it would be so great to do a show with um, some work from Britain, with someone like Richard Wentworth and Michael Craig Martin and Bruce McLean and Douglas Gordon and Martin Creed. I don't know why those names came up, this sort of Anglo-Scottish thing. And, um, and the idea would be that they'd be very easily shippable pieces of work by very interesting artists, and that this would create this sort of dialogue across the Atlantic. And um, so Michael Craig Martin, who's talked here, um, said he would ship his oak tree, which is an actual oak tree, so that was kind of quite an impressive um, <laughs> gesture on his part. And uh, it never happened, but lo and behold, uh, a few months later, Richard's work appeared in TCU, and Gavin had put him in a show. And he did his making do and getting by talk at the Fort Worth Modern, which I've seen him do three or maybe even four times since I was a student. And I found myself sitting in the audience, and I became quite emotional and quite overwhelmed to uh, my surprise. And, uh, and I wondered why that was. And then I realized that it was because Richard carries with him half of London somehow. And uh, suddenly I, had, I could see uh, the, the railway station ceiling in Paddington and uh, Fergus Henderson's bone marrow on toast and all these things that I missed about London and, <clears throat> and other things. And um, then I started to think just how nostalgic I was for the education that I received at Goldsmiths, uh, where Richard, among others, was uh, one of the teachers. And it was a truly remarkable college in a really remarkable time in the mid-'80s. I was there from 83 to 86. I think Rich had stopped teaching there in 87, and he would have been, I worked out, 10 years younger than me now when he was teaching us a lot. And it was a unique place because there were many great teachers, some of which you may have heard of, some of which you may not have. Mary Kelly, John Thompson, Michael Craig Martin, Carl Plackman, Tony Carter, uh, Irma Thubron, John Wood, lots of really interesting people, always changing. The students were as interesting as the teachers. And the really wonderful thing about Goldsmiths was this sense that art is something that can't really be taught. It's just, it's not a teachable subject, but um, it is possible if you're around artists for them to show you what it's like to be an artist. And uh, it's through people like Richard, um, who sort of os whose effect was kind of osmotic, really. You just sort of felt you learn to see the world partly the way he saw the world, and it was a very enriching experience. And I realized as I sat in Fort Worth that I was incredibly grateful for that because it was still going on. 25 years later or whatever, I was, this effect, this osmosis was still um, happening. And um, as I was gathering my thoughts for this, I was decided I wouldn't say that Richard was born in Samoa in 1947 and all that stuff, even though he was, but you can look all that stuff up if you want, but um, <clears throat> I, was, I remembered one thing he said just as I was leaving college to a bunch of us, and he said that the art world, which back then wasn't sort of endless art consultants, art critics, art consultants, slash hedge fund managers, slash art critics, slash skateboarders, and all this sort of stuff. Um, it, back then, it was just sort of artists somehow, and who got the train to work and back and stuff. And um, I remember him saying that the art world, as it was back in the 80s, uh, was like soup. He said it's a bit like minestrone, and everyone has their part. You can be a 
piece of potato, you can be a sprig of parsley, you can be a turnip, you can, you know. I remember sort of thinking, I don't really want to be the parsley very much, but, you know. <laughs> but, um, but it's true. And as I was thinking about this talk, and I was thinking, who does Richard remind me of as an artist? And I, I was thinking of Picasso's sculpture with the, the, uh, the saddle and the bullhorns, which I know that Richard talks about sometimes. Uh, and then I started thinking of Hogarth and um, Brunel, the engineer, and, uh, and John Donne, the poet. And I realized that there's this huge kind of layered richness from l just living in London. If you, if you care to look for it, it's all there. And um, so I googled Hogarth, Richard Wentworth, just for the hell of it. And up comes Soup for 100 at the Foundling Museum in London which was uh, a museum that was founded by Thomas Quorum in, in, uh, way back. It was a hospital for abandoned children, and it's become a museum. And Hogarth, the famous British painter, and Handel, the German-English composer who lived in London, were two of the main benefactors. And in 2008, Richard hosted a, a dinner there for 100 people, young art, young artists and older artists, and among all these fabulous paintings by Hogarth of, of Gainsborough and Thomas Coram and all this stuff, and he served soup and bread. And I thought, well, there's the complete circle. It's so perfect, it's so Richard. And I, I found a shot of the menu, and I think it said rusty nail soup. I'm not sure if that's what it was, <laughs> which you'll understand why that is so perfect. And then apple pie and custard. And on that note, I'd like you to help me welcome Richard Wayne. And you'll find out why in a minute. Thank you. Um, crikey. Uh, it's a bit like going to your funeral. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's very, very nice. And it's sort of true, but I think uh, the way that Richard speaks um, is a little bit... If you, if you have a, a ballpoint and you want to make it work, one of the first actions you can try this at home later is to, uh, you kind of, you tend to, depends which hand you use, but you tend to uh, make a kind of swirling motion with the pen across the paper. Usually a bit frustrating, hoping that the action of doing that will set the ink on. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But if you look at that as a thing, which you've all done, and, I would say it's beyond culture and ever since um, the mechanically supplied pen, which I suppose is an oil product. Um, <laughs> you'll see that that line crosses itself constantly. So the process is one, and I have a feeling that this, somebody in physics will say, yeah, we all know this. But it proceeds across the paper, crossing itself. Uh, but nonetheless, the whole volume is in movement. And I suppose I actually think that's what, that's what a career is. Uh, and it's what life is. So most of your life is going backwards, or at least half of it. But then if you're lucky, you cross, oh my god, a point would be at the floor, and it proceeds. So normal travels proceed. And I think what Richard just described was, you know, he's pretty observant. <coughs> And I wouldn't make those connections, but I recognise that they're true. And I didn't choose Rusty Nail Soup. That was some students of mine. Uh, and I don't, I'm not somebody, I don't like posses, I don't like gangs. Uh, I don't quite know what to do with men in bars. No. I don't quite know how to join in. Um, I like drinking. Um, <laughs> but there is something about, um, and I think we can all do this for each other. You recognise things about how lives get lived um, and how points get across and how moments light up and become significant and other ones drop back. So um, there's no way I would ever instruct any student to, uh, and we must have lost in there too. But isn't it nice that that did happen? And there were no names in it. And um, so is this as. Is, that, is this light enough to see the pictures? Because I think these processes should be kind of magical. Because it, we should, it should feel old-fashioned. If we can lower the lights a little bit more, not least because we've got a bit of seepage. Anyway. Um, 
So this is going to be discursive. And uh, if you don't like discursive, and you won't, you'll never find me if you leave one of my talks. Um, I, I suppose one of the things that's very honorific about today, like today, is that you can't be here by accident. So uh, you all made an effort to be here, and I really like that as a human process, when you gather, when you're um, assembled, and there's a decorum, a very old decorum, more polite people, uh, you're facing the front, I'm meant to give you something, you're meant to take something from me, but it, it's, it's, again, rather like the old one. So we, we all are very optimistic that something could happen in the next 45 minutes, and uh, I need you as much as you need me. So, um, oh, sorry. Oh, can I? Oh, I can pick it up. How modern. Has, have, I don't have to repeat everything that's been said so far. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, everybody here has a story, and uh, you all got born, and uh, you all have a culture. Uh, you, how you represent that culture is pretty complicated, but at the very least, you all speak one language, and some of you might speak anything up to six or seven. Uh, this child was, uh, well, this baby uh, was, um, that was almost um, biblical that moment. Um, <laughs> this baby was eight uh, two days ago, and it was handed to me on my 57th birthday actually plus one, um, as a kind of fresh, fresh member of the community. I'd never met it before. I didn't know the parents very well, but it was born on my birthday. So it was a little bit of a joke. Sa same date as J.G. Ballard. And um, as the baby was handed to me, and uh, of course I'm not a woman, so I'm not entirely comfortable with being handed babies. Uh, I know what to do with them. as a friend of mine who had to deliver his own baby recently, as the person in the hospital said, he was on his phone and said, OK, I've got it out, what do I do now? <laughs> and a voice said, don't drop it. <laughs> um, the thing you do is that you relate to it very, very speedily, because we're humans. Uh, but the strange thing is that the baby doesn't look at you. Uh, it, in fact, exhibits very little. Uh, but so we project onto it that it's a fellow human. Uh, we probably don't give it any culture, but oh yes, we do. Uh, the child doesn't, the baby doesn't speak. Um, it's in fact almost unresponsive. Uh, it's warm and there's a right way round to hold it. You don't gaze at its feet, you look into its face might not look back. This is pretty complicated stuff, I think, and it's the basis of who we all are. And I love the fact that eight years later, this is a little English girl. I think she's called Sophia. She lives in Oxford. She'll be clever. She'll be going to a nice school. Uh, I might be wrong. Uh, but stuff happens. So I'm from the period when I was born. This is England on the right. That is um, an antique. But that is that world of 19, late 40s, 50s, um, post-war Europe, uh, optimistic, but completely run out of money. Uh, I think we might have borrowed it from you. Um, and stuff takes place, and we grow up in that context. And um, some of us were younger than we used to be. And, uh, but we go on speaking of ourselves as if we are that person. That is me. And um, I've always liked looking at pictures. I think uh, quite when I was quite young, I thought that it's an extraordinary thing to be able to look at images. This is long before we worry about what is art. Um, and this is, picture was taken by a very astute um, Dutch photographer. Um, because I've said that, and I can't think of his name, but it'll come. Um, and I, of course, you know, because he's clever, he understands that uh, the gorgeousness of slides, which we don't use anymore, but boy, they were wonderful. You know, the fact that you could physically hold an image. I can actually feel the act of biting the mount flat. You put the two sides of the mount together, you slip the picture in, and you can bite it shut. 
uh, a real engagement with images, which is, I have to say, the computer has taken away from us. And I think even from the remarks that have been made so far, uh, I am really interested in uh, the unaccountable. Um, I don't hugely rehearse how I'm going to go about assembling a work, but I suppose that's like not hugely planning a journey. You still know you're going to go over there and you might need a vehicle or you need your feet or whatever. Um, so the piece on the right, you can tell I know a thing or two about modernism, but I can't be a modernist because I'm just not old enough. Um, and that I understand a world that in, in my culture would have liked to have been French, but then became effectively American influenced. Um, and if you've ever spent any time in France, there were 24,000 of you guys, I'm assuming you're Americans, uh, 24,000 of you in Paris in, I think, 1924. That's a Donna Korn quote. It's quite difficult to say that, Donna Korn quote. quote. Um, and I think the French-American relationship is, is a really fascinating space, and it's quite different from the one that I have with you, or you have with me. Um, the important thing is that you can recognize the eyes quite clever, that that's a desk, that's laminates. There isn't enough laminate to cover the desk, but there's a sort of feeling of effort, and the laminate is fitted to the desk with nails, and the nails are left excessive to the surface. So that is no longer useful as a desk. Uh, and it asks us some questions about surface, um, organization, various histories of modernism. It might even be, maybe it's me shouting at Richard Archfager in the night. Uh, but I would never do that in a very direct way. I mean, it, it's because I look at other things and uh, we have a compass. So um, uh, while I was a student, I worked for Henry Moore. And um, I'm clearly very unlike Henry Moore in all sorts of respects. But I don't think it's a bad thing to be associated with somebody who's doing something very different uh, from what one does oneself. Um, and you learn a lot. And I was 19, and I was listening to Sergeant Pepper. And the, f the best thing that happened while I was at Henry Moore was the first heart transplant took place. Um, I think that's a rather potent image to have that on a crackly old radio and them describing, you know, the patient is still alive, uh, but still in a coma, and he may come round. Uh, um, Christian, have I got him right? Mr. Blyberg? Any Barnard. Christian Barnard, um, and I think the patient was Mr. Blyberg. Um, so you have to imagine that the Henry Moore at the bottom of your garden was made by me. Um, I mixed that plaster. I feared for his criticism, but not much. I really feared for Mrs. Moore's criticism. Uh, <laughs> deeply scary to a 19-year-old. Um, and I'm now very friendly with Mary Moore, who was a totally gorgeous 60s young woman and has no recollection of me working there at all. <laughs> so I want to suggest, you know, that, that cultures like ours, because we share a lot, are somehow heroic uh, and we're looking for heroes and maybe some people want to, uh, will play to that. So there's a way in which Henry did that and there's certainly a way in which Donald Judd has done that, or did that. Um, when I went to Marfa, uh, I think three years ago, um, the most exciting moment was a spider in one of those big sheds. It was just gorgeous. I mean, I don't know how those sheds are maintained. I don't know how all of that's controlled. Uh, it's breathtaking as a statement, really, of visual power. But to find a spider making its way across that milled aluminium was just from heaven. Um, and of course, the thing about art is it lives in different times. So artists die, and I think curators really like a dead artist. I think it's, um, I know because I've met curators who have wished me dead. Um, <laughs> 
there is a freedom of uh, an organizational freedom, and of course there are other constrictions that pile in behind, but there is something quite different about being a live artist and a dead artist. But um, I do live in a culture which is, um, is distinct and strange, and I think you could say quite conflicted, actually, which is a word that's only come into the language in the last 10 years. Um, it's an island. You can only go for 75 miles and you'll be in the water. Uh, that's how little it is. And um, it's been invaded by various people at different times. Uh, and the, the, the reputation for tolerance is probably that you can't turn up. Uh, well, you, once you've turned up, it's not easy to get off. So you better be nice to each other. Uh, so there's something quite strange about being bounded. And it really is very different from mainland Europe, as I said to some German students last week. Well, your job is to make sure that nobody from Vladivostok starts walking and turns up at our end of Europe. And that's your neurosis. It didn't go down very well, but I think it's geographically true. Um, so this building on the left, which we think is charming and how amusing that people make things like this, and of course that language, broadly speaking, rocked up in uh, New England, in the eastern states. Um, that's complete fake. That's all uh, black paint and white paint on plaster. Um, there may be a few pieces of timber in there, but not much. Um, and I see it two or three times a month. Uh, and it restores my confidence in questions of uh, belief, really, which is that humans need to believe. And optically, it looks like a half timber building, which we got from the Saxons, i.e. we got from the Germans, because on the whole, the English take something from anybody that <coughs> they can. Um, just as we have telephone boxes, or did, we don't have them anymore, because we have mobiles. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the English telephone box has a top, and it's something that you all slightly know because you're not quite sure where you've seen it, but that actually is a Byzantine roof form. And that's because we are really good at checking out how other people do things. And then I think we'll have a telephone box, you know? Byzantine, um, yeah. Um, Richard said something about me in relation to London. I mean, London really, you know, if New York is a 20th century city, then London is a 19th century city. Um, but cities, of course, want to continue after their moment of prowess, and then they have great troubles doing that. So London is really invented by the railways. Uh, I mean, it precedes the railways, but the railways are what made it more or less a kind of 19th century LA. And on the right hand, uh, that really, that right hand view is now, I would say, the centre of London. Uh, you can walk five minutes from that spot and you can get in a train which will take you to Paris in two hours, which 15 years ago didn't exist. Uh, those two very uh, handsome, rather Oldenburgish, uh, Nostralesque um, shapes, that's King's Cross Station, that goes all the way to Scotland. And the amusing little clock tower on the right is St Pancras Station, which will take you up the other side of England. And they're sort of statements of, there are little grand centrals, if you like. And I live very near there, and it means a lot to me um, to encounter that. To me, this is all uh, sculptural. It's all very physical. It's not an accident that um, you often hear people with Scots accents near the left-hand building, but you won't hear it so much near the right-hand building, but by the right-hand building you'll hear people speaking French. This is quite generative. I'm also interested in trash, meaning the discarded, and I was walking home five days ago, and I just thought, how bizarre, you know, there's a quite serious sex scandal going on in England about paedophilia. And, you know, we just have to put children's furniture out in some extraordinary state of coitus. Um, 
and um, that's probably already been dropped in the North Sea and sunk to the bottom because we're quite grubby in the way we dispose of things. So the thing that, that I want to suggest is something to do with scale, that I live in a small space with, which has a, a history but not as old as the Italians on the left. That's the hand of a friend of mine who's not for a singer. I love the feeling that that's joined up to a voice. Um, and we've all been living in the period where the gorgeousness, the sumptuousness, the optimism of Italian design has just shrunk down into these little things which, um, since I lost my telephone the moment I arrived in uh, Dallas, uh, are now who we are. We used to lose a pen and then our parents would say, your grandfather gave you that pen, you're a very bad person. You go, well, I'm sorry. But it was a pen, and you could get another pen, and you might even think, how nice, somebody might use the pen. It's not a great feeling, but now you lose your life. But the moment of failure, has, uh, there's escalation attached to it. So even Henry Moore could not have imagined that there'd be art crews walking around making mobile telephones. And the things that I make um, have, as I think artists find out as they work, that they're just full of patterning. So it's only when you make a talk like this you suddenly go, oh, that's so sad, you know, that two balls that touch each other but can't interpenetrate is really no different from two buckets, which I have um, maltreated and made them talk to each other. So there are... Um, codes, languages, forms, um, habits, rather like you look at younger people and you go, oh, it's, aren't they just like their grandmother? Um, the, the, if you like, aspects of uh, genetic force. Um, I really like small things, I think. Um, the things that we hold with our hands, the things that are in relation to our bodies are amazingly uh, substantial and they, they're a source of huge amount of imagery. I think the glass of Absant is still, you know, I'm determined to find the lost one. I'm, it's going to be me that finds this. There were six glasses of Absant and only five are out there. Um, that's a 19... Can we have the date, please, from somebody? 13? Anyway, that's Picasso 1913. It's not here, unfortunately. But I'm just saying that I, I value, you know, sculpture, uh, sculpture can be very big, but there's a lot of, one of the problems with late Henry Moore is that it's rather like <coughs> Oldenburg. <coughs> Oldenburg understood what it is to inflate and conflate, and I don't think Henry really did. So a really big Henry Moore can be um, quite an inflated, Thing. And actually, Henry making work was nearly all made in the lap. It was a, a, an art of um, uh, peeling an apple or whittling. Um, I get lucky, and I think artists, I think if you don't know how to, to make luck, you shouldn't be an artist. In fact, if you don't know how to make luck, you shouldn't be a human. Um, but I was working in Japan, and yes, I did find a paint pot that had, red, had had red paint in it, and I did fit that red paint pot to a piece of galvanized steel of the right proportions for the flag. It's not a great photograph, but... Um, and I'm also interested in uh, the contents of the pocket, uh, the strangeness of... Uh, you find somebody's bag or wallet, you, you know, everybody here is a, a good detective. Uh, the speed with which you give value to um, the, the stuff of culture. So all these brooms are, well, we have a word for them, they're called the brooms, but each one is different and has had a different life story um, and probably had a perfectly good life until I stole it or um, acquired it. Um, just as the way you might mark a dictionary, and I think that dictionaries are truly wonderful places of, um, of reverie, really, that everything I'm saying is second-hand. I mean, how on earth do we learn to assemble 
this stuff called words into something that another person might briefly think made sense. What is that? Um, what is that process? And we all do it. That's that's what a conversation is. It's that we can actually finish the sentences of the other human who is speaking to us during a conversation. It's miraculous. And the desire to do that, so even if you haven't got the command of the other person's language, you will feel that sort of Mobius strip of, of mutuality, which I want to feel with my cat, but it's not working. Um, and I've made a lot of dictionaries where they're fit to bust. They're sort of bulimic. Um, if I'm lucky, I travel. Some of these pictures are better than they look. It's, we've got a bit of light trouble, but never mind. Uh, that's a Chinese coal store on the right, on the left. So that blackness is the sort of gorgeousness and the strangeness of somebody else's need to store fuel. And um, you might think I think all of the things I'm saying before I would ever take a photograph. I, not at all. I, I'm like a dog, I'm completely instinctive, and I make a photograph very quickly. Um, somebody said the other day, you're really Eggleston in drag. And I went, no, he's a photographer. I'm not a photographer, I'm a sort of reporter, or a chronicler, or um, uh, I'm a vacuumer upper. Um, it, only looking at the picture on the right, I kind of go, is it possible that humans can do this? <laughs> is it possible? Yes, they can. Um, the idea that we're laughing at people, or we're laughing with people, in um, Kashgar, which is the pretty well the, the westernest point of China, nearly in Afghanistan, um, is exactly what photography allows. You know, the fact that I took the picture, and many others, and it's turned up for other obvious reasons in this talk. So, implicit in what I'm talking about are, are really structures, and the fact that we read structures, or we read images incredibly quickly. So we know this child, this fictitious child on the left is having a party, it's in the English landscape, it's in a part of England called the Cotswolds, which are the, currently the seat of the British government. Um, <laughs> read on, uh, I, won't, uh, I won't digress, um, but I like very much that we live by codes and we recognise ownership, uh, um, little fortifications, little, little presences that humans carry around with them which eventually adds up to a social condition. Uh, and it's legible, and we read it all the time. So the picture on the right is quite near the dark, the nighttime picture of King's Cross, which I showed you with the two stations. This is this sort of slightly crazy, um, you know, we, had, if you look it up in history books, we were, we stopped having an empire in about 1895. I mean, the First World War was completely unnecessary. You know, Germans and you guys had already completely overtaken the economy. It was over. But of course, that's not how it works in, in history, because you've got people who go, we have an empire, we have an empire. So the First World War, we even have a Second World War. And now we have football. And, um, you know, people are crazy enough to climb up a concrete lamppost. I love these people arriving. I asked them to come earlier. And, and it's great. There's three of them out there. It's fantastic. Come in! <laughs> yes! Um, and there's a belligerence in the culture which I find interesting, you know, uh, the speed of communicating that this lamp is dead, that's a 1950s pattern lamp, uh, cast concrete, and someone has just written on it, out, and uh, it is no more, it has gone. So really what I've tried to suggest so far, and I've got less than 20 minutes, is um, that there's no direct, well, it's a little bit like um, your diet. You, everybody here eats, they have, have something we call taste or um, predilection or preference. 
And what we eat is related to how we look. Not in a very literal way. During, during the war in England, they told you that if you'd eat carrots, you would um, see in the dark. Um, I'm told it actually just makes you go slightly orange. Um, but there is a way in which we, our well-being is related to what we... Uh, I think you can actually spot, I mean this is a terrible thing to say, I think you can read education in people. You can certainly read curiosity in people. And curiosity can often exist in a profound way in somebody who has no education at all. And sometimes it's very shocking because Obviously, this is an audience, this is very highly, we are a very highly educated group because you couldn't be here otherwise. You would probably not know about it. And I think these are quite delicate spaces between how we're informed, what we give off, um, who we spend time with, uh, how we make, French word of course, how we make a milieu, uh, how we make our world, um, who we talk to, what do we discuss, with who. So I, I'm suggesting that some of the images I've shown are something to do with my d diet and appetite, but it's not a tidy thing. It's not like I once saw a stick on a shelf and then I went to the studio and I made one. It's not coming out of anything so tidy. Um, I know why I make these, because, um, because they're frail and slightly pitiful, uh, but gorgeous, and they're simply there, and I cannot tell you how wonderful it is the moment that you put a stick. Usually I still like to install things, so you might be very high up, you make this precarious perch, and then you take the stick and you put the stick on, and that moment, that's the work. Unfortunately, the nature of art is that you end up with these dumb things. Luckily, everything upstairs doesn't say, do you know how long it took to cast this? You know, things have procedures. Henry Moore's major acts of quite old-fashioned production. Um, and I suppose I want a lighter art. That's not L-I-T-E-R, uh, but it's, it's... I want to do something which where I will hope that other humans will somehow sense some of what I'm saying, but without any of the verbiage. Um, I had a terrible fall on a ladder um, about 18 months ago. Uh, and it was, um, you need to imagine a kind of, um, let's say, a terrace area about the height at the top of that door. And my wife is somewhere up there, and I'm about, I'm at, let's say, about the back of this theatre. And as I went up the ladder, um, I was pruning a tree. Um, I thought, uh, go down, this is not stable. I've been up lots of ladders, I think they're very interesting. And so I already knew, just in a bodily way, that this was not good. But literally, as the thought registered, the ladder went, ha 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 ha! And down I went, probably not very far, but of course the head is along, you know, a full, in my case, a shrinking six foot from uh, the point of the feet. And um, I landed, and, uh, and that brilliant word, I was spread eagled, um, in delicious French grass, you know, gorgeous, sumptuous, lovely French grass. And my glasses went whoosh, somewhere. And my first thought was, this is very serious. So I started that kind of um, check, you know, that limb moves, this limb moves, you know, I'm having thoughts, uh, I'm not unconscious. But the thing that was most terrible was that, and I think it's to do with um, survivalism, really, and, and, uh, the, and the way, the, the pity of how we survive, um, I just wanted my glasses. I just had this, where are my glasses? But I couldn't say anything because I was wounded. And at which point, that's about enough time for you to imagine, my wife has come down some steps very quickly. And she's going, are you alright? I'm going, uh, What I'm actually saying publicly is I'm terribly ashamed of having done it because I think it gave her a terrible fright. 
And um, uh, she might be delighted, but well, I don't have to deal with him anymore. But she would have had to deal with that particular incident. Uh, inaccessible spot, French helicopters, well, I'm going to get there, etc. Um, but I think there is a metaphor in that. And it's probably not an accident that this is two sticks in a little clinch. Uh, and you can decide who is the boss. Um, I've made a lot of things which hang, and I think that's very, I have no doubt, I mean, this is such an amazing place, the Nasha, I just, I want to lick the floors, I just, it's, it's just, you know, it's just a, how lovely to be in Italy, in Texas. Um, I'm sure that the Nasha will have done a show which has some reference to suspension, or it'll not, it won't be literal, it won't be anything on a string. Uh, those are terrible shows. Um, but I do think the space above our heads is incredibly interesting. I think, and it, I think in history it's been very strong. It's, a lot of memorials are about that. Um, cathedrals are about that. Uh, light windows. I think the act of looking up is a very, very unusual space. This is a work I've made about three times, and it involves pretty much as many books as I can get my hands on. And the most important thing is that they mustn't be. Um, they have to. The, the 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 term book is the important term, not content. So your guaranteed collision. This was made first for a, a show. Well, the first time this was shown at, at this scale was made for a show that Rosa Martinez did in Istanbul. And um, I was told, on no account, no Bibles or Korans, which was upsetting, uh, because they're books. And um, I promise you the whole through them is very, very small. The book is still a perfectly operational book. Um, but the thing I wanted to introduce really was Apart from this, uh, the time that this has a name, it's uh, titled Full Ceiling, uh, which of course was invented, I guess, full ceilings are more or less start in the 50s, 60s. Uh, they are the condition of denying structure and making a kind of comforting skin above our heads, which often we're not really very happy with, but we get them. Um, but this was mostly put up by my youngest son, who's quite athletic and um, brave, and, and I think is in that worst possible position. You know, the youngest son of an artist is just terrible. Uh, but he is always very gracious about it and sometimes helps me. Um, anyway, the, the primary problem of making the show was to find a way, it's very, very if you're as unfit as I am, it's very bad to spend days with your head back like this, looking at the ceiling. You will get quite severe neck ache. Uh, and you've got a young man walking around on a grid above saying, come on, Dad, make a decision, make a decision, where, where? And because this was in a rather elaborate show that Rosa had put on, we had a code for uh, deciding which direction the books would go in and um, go to the left, go to the right, not very interesting, so we'd have towards the library, towards the cloakroom. But the great thing about it was that a friend of ours was putting up a work for somebody that you know and I know quite well. And um, so the key memorable term of this um, activity was towards a niche, away from a niche, towards a niche, towards a niche, towards a niche, away from a niche, away from a niche. You do that for three days, uh, this will damage your health. <laughs> this is said young man, Venice Biennale, impossible. I think nobody really discusses this very well, that, that what are the conditions in which artworks are made, what are the support systems, I mean what a nutty thing to, why don't we get a lot of art and take it to a place prone to flooding and try and deliver it against the clock in um, ridiculous heat conditions um, and get it ready for a gorgeous public, uh, a complete madhouse. And my favourite part of making this particular show was seeing Bruce Nauman looking um, 
sort of lanky and private, moving through Venice, obviously with the same thoughts as I had, you know, can't get me off this island. Um, but of course it makes an event, and the, the event is called the Venice Biennale. And I love these pictures of gathering. That's um, Ivor Bracca looking very suave in black with the white V moving through that space. Um, and I, I, I think it is a subject, I think how things are made, why they're made, how they're made, how they get there. I mean, really, I, I've already suggested that sometimes the pleasure of the event, however anxious, uh, is much greater than, the, let's say, the final perceptions of the work. So, for grumpy Italians, walking those ladders, they were actually walking, those ladders were being walked while they sat on them pulling things up into space, is a kind of art pleasure. I mentioned books. I've found a way of imprisoning books, um, which involves a humble, um, traditional technique, which you probably all grew up with, certainly the boys, uh, soldering. Uh, so you can actually put a book into a sort of medieval condition of being um, unvisitable but therefore much more desirable. Um, Thinking Aloud was a show I did, which we could save it for questions, but um, if you don't want to go home. Um, I think it's nice to have made a book which I'm quite proud of, an exhibition that I'm quite proud of. I think the term is I curated it, but I, I just made an exhibition, I'm happy with that. Um, that you'll, you can't look at the catalogue anymore because that's wrapped up like a, pl a parcel. Um, and I talked about bulimia. This is in a show in New York um, a year ago, two years ago, um, where I just picked up everything in the street. I have no fear of doing that. People look at you as if you're at my age. They really do look at you. Um, <laughs> And Tom Sachs is a friend, and Tom said, amazing, where did you get this crap? Incredible, so New York. <laughs> um, and then all the nice people in the gallery went, oh, where did you get all this stuff? It's terrible, it's just walking here from the hotel. It's just the condition of the street. And of course, what falls, you, I think it's not gonna work so well in Dallas, but what falls to the floor is incredibly interesting. Of course, it all has meaning. Often we're not quite sure how to nominate what that meaning is, but it's, it's certainly what the archaeologists are going to pick up uh, when we're all gone. Um, this is interesting. Uh, the, the big project in which this appears is something called the um, uh, Folkestone Triennale uh, in an interesting town that uh, had a bad time but has picked itself up. And I made these signs which have a kind of authority about them but you don't really know why they're there. So they're not put there by local government, they're not signed by me, they don't have a label beside them that tells you this is an artwork. Uh, but they deal with trees and they deal with, I think, the profound fact of trees. I think a tree is really quite the most extraordinary thing the way it's rooted, the way it's, the way it's there. And um, in England, you can pretty well say, if the tree is there, we allowed it to be there. It, meaning we don't do nature, we just do gardening. Um, and a very sweet thing, when the show opened, um, somebody from the press, who looked more intelligent than the question I'm about to tell you they asked, um, said to me, did you make it all up yourself? And I thought, that's a kind of child's question. It's so beautiful, it's so gorgeous. And I didn't know what to say. I thought, well, yes. <laughs> but questions of belief, truth, what, you know, when we believe, you know, you walk around the Nasha, you read very well articulated um, labels, uh, little, um, historiographies, little, 
you, you don't doubt them. And then, of course, you have a show here at the back here, which is completely wonderful because it's full of games. It's full of naughtiness. So you're no longer sure what anything quite means. And I think this falls within that category. And they're still, they, they were um, bought by some nice people called Outset. And um, so they're permanent. So galloping to a close, I think this question of identifying where you are, what you are, who you are, how you invent your own culture. So two people in um, Kashgar, I was eating lunch. Uh, I don't speak Uyghur, they're Muslims. Uh, they look Turkic, so uh, it's an 8,000 mile gap. So there's a sort of real history of the world of Central Asia all the way through. To, it's an Alexander the Great sort of feeling, let's say. Um, very pertinent to the politics of now. Um, and they saw that I had a guidebook to Beijing and they just took it. And obviously they can't read English. And they just looked at the pictures and it was the most um, sumptuous way to eat lunch next to people sharing something which is about their culture but is not. So they're actually looking at um, a roasted pig, they're Muslim, uh, and they're in a kind of state of wonder. And I, I suppose that I applaud that human possibility. And how anyone organises um, the systems of computers in China, I don't know, but there really is somewhere that you can go at half past, just after midnight, called Intangibly. Uh, it's waiting at a Rumshi airport. And I recommend it. Um, I took that flight. So, this is a commonplace, and I, I, what I hope is clear, I'm interested in, in encounter. I'm not interested in being a train spotter or a nerd. I don't want to go out looking for signs that say where we are. But it is an interesting part of modernity that people will tell you where you are. And of course, what we're all doing in order to be... Um, well, in order to think that we're functioning, where every day we get up and we have to invent who we are and why we are, and I think that's what artists do. Um, I do get lucky. Um, I went to Marfa, somebody lent us a house, and I noticed as I was preparing this talk that I took this photograph, how nice that people know that that glass turned upside down. Those of you interested in physics will know why that works better upside down, but the person who put it there won't have spent a long time thinking about it or look, looked it up in a book. But they've got the right amount of air coming through the sash window. And around the same time, I went to the hardware store in Marfa because I'd have to, because I had to see if, and sure enough, oh yeah, he used to come in here, Mr. Judd. We knew Mr. Judd. Just, always nice when you get that feeling of a back-to-front connection. And you produce, still produce in the States, this absolutely beautiful bend, which is a reducer from one size to another, a pipe bend. And of course, I have to have one. And then I go back to the, um, the house we're staying in, and there's this little, somebody here will be able to identify it, but it's part of a pipe. I don't know whether it's pre-Columbian, but it's jolly old. And, and there you have language just at work. You know, one is called a pipe, and the other is called a pipe, but we wouldn't wish to get them muddled up. If you want to smoke tobacco, you don't go up to the plumbing. Um, so all of these questions of feeling that you know where you are matter to me. Um, so if you spend any time in the um, Arsenali in um, Venice, you go, I think that's in the Arsenali, and you'd be right. And it's not an accident that people buy things that have physical association. We are, <coughs> I think, self memorializers. So you live in Marfa, it's not going to take long before you've bought a yardstick which says Marfa, Texas. <laughs> I have all sorts of collections which really I don't quite know what they are, but I've been. I said to some architect friends the other day, I wonder if architecture isn't just the art of how to finish things. I, 
I'm going to regret saying this because my wife is going to bring it up because I'm not a completer. Um, but actually, architecture is how are you going to meet the ground? How will you meet the sky? How will this element stop before it meets that element? It's just a long, long extrapolation of joining and meeting. How do you get from one space to another? Is it going to be an enfilade, etc.? And um, I think it's sort of shaming that I don't know that. I mean, meaning I thought it for the first time about two weeks ago. And I've got countless pictures of how you end a piece of cloth of scalloping. These, in fact, are in China. I've got countless pictures of people who've stopped abruptly. And a lot of pictures of um, what really is printing uh, the gorgeousness of the tire track. And I love that picture on the right because the eye keeps saying it's the wrong way around, but it's because light does that and it shows how deeply we are. You really want the shadow to come from the other side and I promise you that picture is the right way around and you will never, you know, we need a good psychologist, but you'll never get happy with that picture. You turn it around and you go, no, you turn it back. But I was there, I took that picture, I didn't realise it would have this effect on us, but it's pleasure, I think, to understand something about visual mechanisms. <laughs> Your laughter means I don't have to speak. <laughs> and to finish off, I thought I would just show you, you know, these photographs sometimes exist as series, or uh, the questions about, I'm not a photographer, I'm very interested in, in the ability of photography as a kind of conveying mechanism. And I'm very interested in inverted commas photography. But um, I think it's good to see things in talks like this where everything isn't um, placed product or um, delightfully presented and with, with what you might call the final authority of the show. The show on the right is in um, uh, I never know whether to say, what do I say, Freeman? Nelson Freeman. Do I say Nelson Freeman? Thank you. I always get, okay, so that's in Nelson Freeman in Paris, um, a bit over a year ago. Uh, and the thing that I thought was best about that show was that it has two columns. So there's a space downstairs that has a column, and a space upstairs that has a column. And I tied to the columns the same dumb elements in each space, so you can't see them both at the same time because humans are really not that clever. So you have to come up the stairs and you'll find the same elements but in a different, well in fact in a reversed order. So the column became a sort of uh, uh, memorial space or uh, um, all those things that humans do where they attach something to something else to tell you that something happened, flowers for it death or a yellow ribbon or whatever, that sort of language. Um, so really the act of understanding that meant walking up the stairs. Um, it's definitely not a display of two columns with objects attached. Um, French timber harvested at the wrong time. Uh, I'm sure that um, Marcel and I could discuss this at some length. Um, you can buy bottle racks quite uh, easily in France. Um, for sure he understood that they were just ridiculously eccentric objects. You know, there's far, you know, it's been ruined by art history, the bottle rack. The bottle rack is wild. And they're known in um, some parts of France, France as un if, that's I-F which is just brilliant if you're English, because it's like, well, is there some kind of question going on here? But if is actually a yew tree, and if you've ever had a yew tree, um, you'll see that yew trees make pegs. So you have one of those long etymologies that once upon a time, yew trees made were the, were the paper machine of life, and this is a sort of industrialized version. I'm foolish enough to have wrapped that in sarum wrap, um, I would say about eight turns for every surface. I don't recommend that kind of art. Um, 
it should be practiced by someone like Effa Hess who really got it. <laughs> Uh, but I did it, because, obviously, because I want to put the bloody thing to sleep. That's a sort of anesthetization. But it also then glows, because a lot of sarum has a funny light value in it. Um, and these shelf brackets, you'll understand, are adjusted to accommodate their recalcitrant boards. It's a small show in uh, the Whitechapel in London, which I'm not going to dwell on, because we're just two pictures now. Uh, I've talked about the plural. Uh, I was so worried in the summer about becoming um, pompous that I bought a pipe uh, to keep in my pocket, which I foolishly left behind today. Um, but I think the pipe is an extraordinary thing and we don't really use them anymore. And I've just made a show in the Manchester Museum in England, which has the best um, uh, collection, well, a very, very good Egyptian collection, and they asked me to, to respond to the idea of the tomb. Well, actually, I think the department store is our tomb. When we're gone, that's what somebody's going to rock up and have a look at and go, they thought they needed all of this? <laughs> and so I have made, in the middle of, as you can see, a very serious you can see in those vitrines at the back, very, um, you know, beautifully, highly intelligent display of the fact that museums always have the plural. They always have a lot of something because that's how you deal with the typologies. So I've bought all sorts of nonsense and displayed it. I've really enjoyed thinking about our culture, you know, that 30, I said to some students the other day, well, you're post-silicon people. You just use silicon like it was normal, but we didn't have silicon. Um, Alexander Calder didn't know what silicon was. Um, this changes the way that art gets made. And there's one vitrine that, that's during the install, so it doesn't have the cable hanging. But these, the, the paraphernalia with which we live, um, now everything seems... Once upon a time, I'd have liked to have said, oh, it's all American made, but I'm afraid that's all Chinese made. But it's actually, um, it is sort of how we live. And I've probably bought every single one of those things at some point with a real purpose. Um, but there are a few things in there which are nuts and they're just on the open market because they are. I've just been in Cornwall, which I really recommend to you. Um, and I suppose this really is an image to tell you that the great thing about time is that you only need half the information and you can still tell it. That's a work I did in a theatre in um, Warwick, Warwick University. Cornwall was very, very rich, um, had all the world's tin, but then they discovered Brazil and that's what happens. This is Basel, last June. Not big enough space, but quite sexy to work in. Um, steel pipes. Uh, if you've got a bit of chain, you can play with it and you can actually arrange it in such a way that two links of the chain are not in contact with each other. You can do that with your fingers. So this is an incredibly elaborate device which salutes some other artists. Um, where the two cramps, you say clamp, we say cramp. Um, no, you say cramp, we say clamp. Um, the two cramps at the top prevent two of the links from being in contact with each other. So every time you get to the top, the gravity of the chain, the, the physical contact of the chain is disrupted. And it's probably only with the eye that you really understand that. It requires, um, these are not great pictures, and it actually needs a populace. Uh, and it really works very well when it's populated. And we're very near the end. I thought we should have something that was frightfully old. This is um, the end of a, well, it's what's left of a priory in Lincoln. And um, I like doing shows that are um, at the edge of professional. I like to be approached by people who say, would you do this? And I think I have more hits than misses. So this is a show that's made 
inside crates, and each artist was given a crate. Sort of show I would not normally do, but I really admire the man who organised it. And frankly, to spend a day in this extraordinary space that is that old was rather magical. And you can just about sort of work it out, but I chopped it up upside down, and from the top hang jars of honey, and in the honey are honeycombs. It's a little politic in there, there's a bee crisis, but that's not what primarily drove it. You'd probably guess the colour color might have driven it as well. But the honeycomb, of course, is the sort of, well, probably our most popular image of housemaking. Um, and there's something about, um, um, I'm labouring the point, it's a visual object. Gravity, I think you've noticed all the way through, is something that I just, I think it's wonderful. We're all going to fall down. Most of our days are spent using up perfectly good energy, just trying to keep our muscles from keeping us from falling over. Um, it's a bad picture, well it's not a bad picture, it's a great picture, but on the right are people who've been servicing the sewers of London and they've just taken their boiler suits off and they're all hanging on the London railings. Tate, Liverpool on the left, about three, four years ago, um, still cheers me up when I'm being maltreated at an airport that I did that. Um, and people make, a, make an astounding effort to make their way through that because they're interested in what the bale, how it feels to get to the bale. So I suppose that's to do with the way that I'm interested in destination. Um, a show that was shared with my wife where I felt so delicate about that she makes these fantastic, very, um, uh, they're very assertive, speedy, luscious watercolours and this was a joint show which Jeremy came to and um, I wanted to somehow, well I was in charge because she was away, so um, my photographs were in the lesser spaces, I, they went along the floor, her work was in the commanding position but then I put it all up in a rather brutal way with four blobs of black silicon each squidged against the wall. She has a new way of framing and I really recommend it, it's terribly quick. <laughs> this is another show which is in an abandoned laundry. Um, I wanted you to see these two pictures because I love the fact that I would never do that and that. I mean, if I had seen that, I wouldn't do it. But I love the fact that I did it without seeing it. And I didn't see it because I was in a hurry. Because I think the way to hang that kind of show should be speedy. And a lot of people who care about photography were really horrified. They said, how could you put four five-inch nails through each photograph? And I said, easily. <laughs> so the love of, um, you yeah, know, the fiction of nationhood. Uh, read Eric Cogsborn, who's just died, wonderful writer. Um, the love of light. And um, stay young. Thank you. Falmouth, which is that bit that sticks out at the bottom of England and nearly touches America, but really not at all. Um, and we, I got to the end and the nice woman who ran the school said, are there any questions? There was complete silence and I thought, that's a sign of a quite good talk. Uh, I don't think it's, that I don't, wouldn't want anyone to feel obliged and I know that it's ten minutes after we said it would be, but... Um, uh, do ask questions if you want, and if not, I gather we can do that in another way. Oh, there's one behind you. You, you have such marvelous thoughts, and as you go through the course of a day, 
Uh, I'm wondering if you reserve these thoughts by writing them down, or does everything come spontaneous at the moment? Well, that's a very touching question. I do write down a lot of things, but I write them, as you might imagine, on um, insignificant pieces of paper. And I normally have the whole of my left hand covered in notes on the, in, on the palm, which my children call my palm pilot. Um, <laughs> sometimes I put that in the photocopier. Um, but I think, I, you know, I'm taking what you said as a compliment, but I think if you've got this illness, which it is, I think, it's, a, it's um, you know, I'm somebody who had a very good education but resisted it because I'm from the 60s and it was just too, England was just utterly confusing to me. I, I couldn't understand what was happening at all. Um, maybe I don't understand it now, but at least I spent some time inhabiting it. Um, I think, um, it's, it's, a, um, I think what I'm trying to say is that I, I know I'm a grand amateur, uh, which is a terrible, I'm horrified to think I've said that publicly. <laughs> I mean, that has been the great British problem, great English problem, but it's also um, a privileged space. So I'm in, interested in too many things, but don't have the depth in any of them pull them all together. So a moment like this is like being a therapist, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, that is a prepared talk. There were sequences of thought. I'm trying to hold it together. It's not going to be a mess, but it's pretty much coming out of the soles of my feet. Yeah, I want to know when you collect objects in the street, do you, when you pregnate the dictionaries, do you connect that with a specific word in the dictionary? When you put it in a certain... It's a lovely question, actually, because... Um, uh, well, you can test this. Um, walk down the street, which is the best place to do it, I think. Walk down the street and see what you can nominate. And actually notice how tragically slow process is. So there's hundreds of things that you, you won't find the word for, but that's because this is quite slow. It's like a sticky computer. And then there are lots of things for which you think there probably must be a term, but you don't know the term because it's not within your province. And then, of course, there's all the space in between, which is the space of the unnominated, uh, which is why when we speak to each other, we are very circuitous because we want to be more specific than we can be, but we're not, which is maybe why we end up as poets. Um, so I have made things which play with the idea of absolute specificity, but I think most of the works I've made with dictionaries are about the defeat of that, and they're much more. I mean, that really bulimic one in New York, I think is really going try naming me, try naming this. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, there isn't anything there that really comes tidily or out of, um, let's say, the most correct procedures that you would find in late 60s art, where people are sometimes really trying to get those things to conjoin. Um, but that's like the pleasure of failure. I mean, that's like... Um, I mean, it, I think, I, while I'm speaking, I'm actually looking thinking, I don't have words for it all. Um, and the dictionary, you know, the, the great thing, you know, obviously, you've all, all of you who are still here, you speak English. It is, in fact, as Barbara Walters once said to me, do you speak English? <laughs> I'll tell you the rest of that story in a second, because it involves Kissinger. Um, it's true. Um, English is just so wild because it's, it's really Latin and then broken Latin because the French messed it up. Um, Celtic, uh, Danish, um, Anglo-Saxon, um, and anything that we could nick, steal, you know, there's lots of Indian in there. And khaki is an Indian word, bungalow is an Indian word. 
And I, I think that feeling that if you do speak English, you're, you are actually speaking out of a sort of soup. And it's a, it is a very remarkable and strange thing. Um, it doesn't have. Tony Craig gave a lecture the other night, and he has become slightly German. I mean, he's lived there for 40 years. And at one point, he, he made up a German English word, which is just brilliant. It was something like unoverseeable. It was better than that, but it was something we don't say. Um, and, you know, so he's becoming a translator. And of course, that's what art is it is a sort of desperate attempt to translate something which, until it's made, is is not specific, which is why we go back again and again to a picture, because it does something for us that dumb words won't do. Too long a reply. Um, <laughs> Barbara Walters, Henry, is just a good way of ending. Um, salon group, I, to my mind, I sort of feel it would be something that Voltaire would have recognized. Small group of people, Berlin, don't know why I was there. I mean, I know why I was in Berlin. Small group of people, private apartment, a uh, man called Joachim Sartorius. I walk in, I'm late, nothing new. Um, there's a gathering in the corner, mostly standing up. Mm, certainly not more than a quarter of this audience, I would say. And I see there's lots of attention being given. And I, I think one of the things I haven't talked about is that I'm really interested in power. What is it? You know, what a weird thing power is. And of course, I join the group. People have got their backs to me. Um, Kabakov is there, Mrs. Kabakov, other artists. And I look and I see that there are seated people, and there's Barbara Walters, who you know better than me, who oh, I didn't really know at the time, and still don't. And uh, Kissinger, it's 1994, I think, it might be three. And um, Kissinger says something. I don't know what it was, but I'm, as you probably gathered, slightly Tourette-ish. And I couldn't resist saying something back quickly, which I did, I don't know. So I might have said that's completely untrue. I don't know. <laughs> and I had been introduced, I and mean, I was just the latest person to arrive in this group. And, and, and she said, she heard me, heard my accent, and she said, um, do you speak English? I put this down. And I, I went, I am English. <laughs> and I realized like that's quite an interesting moment where you can feel quite, I'm not somebody that wants to walk around holding my passport. I'd like to be a citizen of all cultures all the time, everywhere. And that would be a gorgeous place to be. Uh, but I realized that I was really offended with her. There's something about it that was sort of doubtful, really. And questioned my command of the language. <laughs> and Kissinger sort of was like a big sucker. He came straight on to me. Uh, and we ended up talking for about five or ten minutes, mostly about Margaret Thatcher. Mostly, and I would have been 40 something, 45. Um, and he wanted to know what my perceptions of Margaret Thatcher were, which are actually more generous than you might imagine. Meaning that politics, politics stuff happens. It's never. It, it's deeply, deeply, deeply contingent. I can say that now. I was probably forming that thought then. So I said some things that were kind of slightly generous to her, but certainly not um, no applause. And. Um, <coughs> Kissinger suddenly said, that is exactly what Harold Macmillan said. Which is, you know, Harold Macmillan, some of you know who he is, most of you won't. He's the Prime Minister of my childhood. He's my first sort of political memory. And um, I felt a bit confused by that, because that's like saying I'm speaking like a man born in 1899, <laughs> um, which is troubling. <laughs> And anyway, the punchline was that Kissinger said, nobody has had the luck of the English, which I often quote. And I think it's pretty perceptive, actually, because the English never intended to, to um, invent an empire. It was, uh, came out of um, mercantile, sailing mercantile, uh, adventurism, and theft. 
uh, in a nice soup. And uh, it took place. I mean, I wasn't there, but it took place. And just about when anyone else made a mess of something, we seem to have been mildly advantaged. You know, the French monarchy never paid for its ships, okay, ended up with Island Navy, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, well, I'm not going to meet Kissinger again, but I thought that's certainly whatever we may feel about power, that is, you know, that's quite a little statement, and um, I've shared it with you. Thank you very much.